If you turn to your Bibles in Romans 13, verse 1. Again, please turn in your Bibles to Romans 13, verse 1. So we're going to talk about spheres of influence or spheres of authority. I like that one better. Spheres of authority. So Romans 13, verse 1. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, a day that you have ordained, that we, your people, would gather again, Lord God, in the middle of the week to hear from you. So, Father, I pray, as my brother said, that you would speak clearly through me, and, Lord, that you would grant us all understanding and wisdom, Father, that we may live a life that is pleasing to our Lord and Savior, a life that emulates him better, And Father, also that in this world that we might be useful. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to begin with the democratic branches of authority. Now, I got all this information right here from the houseofrepresentatives.org, okay? So if you have some issue with it, take it up with them. So we have three branches of authority. The first one is the legislative. The legislative branch is made up of the House and the Senate, known collectively as the Congress. Among other powers, the legislative branch makes laws, declares wars, regulates interstate and foreign commerce, and controls taxing and spending policies. The branch organizations are the architect of the Capitol, the center of the legislative archives, the National Archives and Records Administration, Congressional Budget Office, Government Accountability Office, Government Printing Office, Library of Congress, Office of Compliance, the U.S. Senate. And now that moves us to the executive branch, and I think this is one that probably most of us are familiar with. But this is the executive branch consists of the president and his or her advisors and various departments and agencies. This branch is responsible for enforcing the law of the land, for enforcing the law of the land. And again, here are some of those organizations and agencies. The executive office of the president, the president's cabinet, which is the federal agencies, the independent federal agencies, the commissions of the U.S. government and Federal Information Center, and it says U.S. jobs. And our third one, again, the judicial branch. The judicial branch consists of the U.S. Supreme Court and the Federal Judicial Center. According to the Constitution, The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may form or may from time to time ordain and establish. The federal judicial system is the education and research agency of the federal courts. Now, let's move on to biblical spheres of influence. And again, Before we look at the four, I'm I'm naming four of them. Most people usually work with three of them, but I'm gonna name four of them because I think they're all necessary and we do need to talk about them. But before that, I got one order of business that I want us to look at. And that is with our verse in Romans 13, one. And what we garner from that is that all in various levels of authority come from God. Again, all and all various levels of authority come from God. Romans 13, 1, 
Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Why? For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. So all authority is from God. William Hendrickson rightly states it this way. The civil magistrates to whom Paul refers from the emperor down to the rulers of the lowest rank in the final analysis owed their appointment and right to govern to God. It was by his will and in his providence that they had been appointed to maintain order and encourage well-doing and punish wrongdoing. Cranfield adds, God sets up and overthrows rulers that no one actually that no one actually exercises ruling authority unless God has at least for a time been being or set them up. So he's the one that sets up, he's the one according to our verse that establishes the authority. Now, the question that I want to ask, what do we do about evil? What do we do about wicked authorities? Well, I found another quote that I thought was really good. This is by R.C. Sproul, and he says this, Paul, when his life was about to end by the sword, ruled the day he wrote these words, the words in Romans 13, 1. He faced the vicious and unjust execution. More than likely, when Paul put his head on the block, his last thought was that Nero's authority to execute him came ultimately from God, and he died willingly. Now, he continues. Can we look past such authorities and, like Paul, See the authority that stands behind them and see him as a gracious and good God that, yes, is also sovereign and holy. He says here, shall God not avenge his own elect who carry out day and night to him or cry out day and night to him? Luke 18, verse 7. Will God not? Set the scales of justice right? When we are victimized by unjust, demonic governments that do everything but work for the glory and honor of Christ, God notices. Our Lord will vindicate his people who seek to be faithful to him despite the injustices that comes their way from the earthly authorities. So before we go on, we live in a culture, y'all, that doesn't really want to hold these things up, these things, these spheres of authority, these biblical spheres. They want to do away with them. The first ones they want to enlarge them in such a way that they run out of bounds and go into the, the lives of the individual, the lives of the family, the lives of the church, stretching their authority past what God has given. And so what we're going to look at today is the authority of the church. We're going to look at that through Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. We're going to look at the authority of the family from Ephesians 5, 22 through chapter 6, verse 4. We're going to look at the authority of the state from Romans 13, 1 through 7, and the authority of the individual from Romans 2, 12 through 16. So let's begin with the church, the authority of the church. If you would turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20, reads in this way. 
Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And the bold Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ the son of the living God. He had a moment of strength there, a moment of clarity. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the, the Christ, that he was the Christ. So, first some things that we should take away from this. From verse 19, it states, again, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So what we learn first is that this is a delegated authority. It is not an authority that they assumed of themselves it is not an authority that they got from other men. It is not an authority that they got from other authorities. No, it is an authority that was handed down to them. Now, the question is, who was it handed down by? And if you look at the text and you look at verse 16, it has the statement that it was the son of the living God. And this here is a statement for the messianic. It is a messianic term that we see often, not only here, but also in the Gospel of Luke. And so here we learn that the one that delegates the authority to the church is Jesus, the Messiah. It is indeed the one that would go to the cross. It is indeed the one that raised on the third day. It is indeed the one that sits at the right hand of the Father right now, petitioning the Father and praying on our behalf. It is indeed the one that will come again to gather his church. It is indeed the one that will come again and set up his millennial kingdom. It is indeed the one that will usher in a new heaven and a new earth. It is indeed the promised Messiah of Israel. It is indeed Jesus Christ. He is the giver of the church's authority. It is an authority that does not come from Peter. It is authority that does not come from the apostles, nor any pastor, preacher, teacher. But as we see in the verses 16 through 18, we see that it comes from the word of God. It comes from the word of God. Look again at verses 16 through 18. Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And now Jesus responding to this answer now says this, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven, verse 18. And also I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock, this natural stone, I will build my church, not the pebble, but the stone. And if you know anything about the rock or the stone, it is also a reference to Messiah. And he says what? I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overpower it. 
And you see here that this authority was given to Peter, not because of anything that he had done, but because he had spoken as the Spirit or as the Lord had given him. So indeed, we can look at this and see that the authority that we have as the church rests upon the word of God. Now, what kind of authority is this? This is a spiritual authority. It's a spiritual authority, a spiritual authority that is mediated through Christ's gifted men. If you would turn to Ephesians 4, let's look. Ephesians 4. Start at verse 9. Start at verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is him himself, also he who ascended far above the heavens, so that he might fill all things. In our verse, verse 11, and he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers or pastor teachers. Why did he give them? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So it is a mediated authority through Christ's gifted men. Secondly, the way that it is mediated is through God's word. It is with the word of God that the pastor, it is with the word of God that the preacher, teacher, that they care and guide and discipline God's church. Now the role of the church, you can go to a systematic theology book and you'll get these same ones. The role of the church is to glorify God to edify believers, and to evangelize the lost. The function of the church, the function of the church is to be a witness to Christ, as we learn from Acts 1, verse 8. Now let's look at the authority of the family. The authority of the family. Now, I am going to read a pretty lengthy portion because I think this guy gets this right and he blesses us. So this guy's name is Toby Sumter and he's from Cross Politic. And this is what he says, verbatim. The family is the ministry of health, wealth and education. This is established when Paul says that a husband must love his wife like Christ loved the church and nourish and cherishes her as he does his own body, Ephesians 5, 29. The word nourishes and cherishes literally means to feed and to keep warm. Paul is likely drawing from the Mosaic law where polygamy was stressed or suppressed through the requirement that a man provide food, clothing, sexual rights for his wife. If a man took a second wife and diminished any of these three, the first wife was free to leave. Exodus 21, verses 10 and 11. He continues, Likewise, in 1 Timothy, Paul insists that the first line of defense for the care of widows is the family. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of the household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. 1 Timothy 5, 18. In context, 
Paul is instructing Timothy when it might be appropriate for the church to support a widow. We should note that Paul never suggests that a widow sign up, and this is his words, for Roman Medicare. Finally, we note that the Bible explicitly charges fathers with the duty of providing a thoroughly biblical education. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you arise, Deuteronomy 6, 7. And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in training, in the training and admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6, 4. The word for bringing up is the same word Paul uses in Ephesians 5, 29, for nourish and feed. And the words for training and admi admonish mean to counsel and culture, respectively. God has granted this particular authority to the family to feed, nourish, and provide for health, welfare, and education. So what can we conclude? The authority of the family goes back to creation before the fall. The garden in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, are given authority and commanded both to be fruitful and to multiply. But within that, they are given the command to rule. And within that command to rule, they are to care for and to tend not only to the creation itself, but indeed those that would multiply from them, which would be their seed. And who is the head of this group? Who is the head of this family? Just as Christ is the head of the church, the Father is the head of his family and is to use his authority for the purpose of care, both spiritually and physically. So we've seen the authority of the church, the authority of the family, and now let's move to the authority of the state. The authority of the state. Move over again to Romans 13. And we will read verses 1 through 7. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do you want, do what is good, sorry, do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is the minister of God, the authority, the governing authority, it is the minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Remember that. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Again, what can we conclude from these? Authority, again, of the state is delegated by God. It does not matter what level it is, the highest to the lowest levels of authority, they are all delegated by God. 
The thing that I find most interesting and the thing that is probably most overlooked in our culture in our day is the fact that the authority of the state is limited. It's limited. If you look again at verses 3 through 4, you will see that it is limited to restrain the wickedness of sinners and to reward those that have good behavior. So authority of the state is delegated by God, just as the family, just as the church. But here, this authority has its limitations. MacArthur says this about this verse. Biblically, the prime duty of civil authority, if you look at the Bible, the Old and New Testament, it is not charity. It is not economics. The primary duty of the civil authority is the moral well-being of its citizens. It is to restrain sinners and reward those who do good so that we can be civilized. Enjoy a a measure of peace and joy in life and God's creation. The civil government uses an even increased threat. The law of God in the heart has a threat to the conscience which will peel guilt on or pile guilt on. The family has a threat of the rod. I think we, we miss that a lot. We don't use the rod very often in these days for fear of the state, which will discipline the disobedient child. You hear that? The family has the threat of the rod, which will discipline the disobedient child. Civil government has an even greater force even a deadly force if necessary. And again, that will come from Genesis 9. And here he says, he ends, civil government is a God-ordained institution to restrain sinners. To restrain sinners. So the authority, we've seen the authority of the church, the authority of the family, and now And we've seen the authority of the state, and now we will look at the authority of the individual, the authority to self-govern, the authority to self-govern. Let's look at Romans chapter 2. Romans 2. So I want us to remember that even this authority to self-govern is given by God. It's given by God, but as a result of the fall in Genesis 3, this authority has been greatly impacted in a negative way. So Genesis 6, 5 through 8, God assesses the condition of humanity. And he says this, and I believe it's sober. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved at his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land. From man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky. For I am sorry that I have made them. And then it ends with such beauty and grace. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Paul even continues to look at the state of men in Romans 3, and he says this, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. 
All have turned aside together. They have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of ass is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in, are in their paths. In the path of peace, they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And then verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God has not left them with an excuse. And now I would have us to read Romans 2, verses 12. For all have sinned without the law, will also perish without the law. All who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Y'all hear that? Again, there is no place for the sinful to hide. There is no excuse that will pass you by the perfect judgment of our Lord and Savior on judgment day. You cannot give him the excuse that you have never been taught, per se, his law. He's taking care of that. Look at verse 13. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law. So these Gentiles who do not have the law, they instinctively find themselves obeying what's in it. Not having a law, he says, are a law to themselves. Verse 15, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts in that they show the work of the law written on their hearts, their conscience doing what? Bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or defending them. Verse 16, on the day when according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ. God has not left man with excuses. No, God has placed a witness within every man. And that witness is the conscience. And that witness is the conscience. He says that they are left without excuse. Romans 1 verse 20, For since the creation of the world... His invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. MacArthur again says this pertaining to these verses. It says it is so sufficient that they are judged for their immorality and judged for their lawlessness and they are without excuse. They have no excuse, no excuse. I'm sure that plays out in the simple reality of that, of life. How many people know the penal code? Very few people could ever come, you could ever come across with any kind of innate sort of knowledge of that code. But boy, whether they know anything in the penal code or not, whether they've come from another country, another nation, whether they complete, are completely aliens from American culture, they know what? They know right from wrong. Why? For the law is written instinctively 
That is the word here. The law is written instinctively. The law is written in their heart. And instinctively, they do the things written in the law. That's the reality. Further, he states, the conscience is a device. Y'all hear that? The conscience is a tool, a device that God has given every human being to react to that law. When you void that law in the heart, you get accused by your conscience. Now some explaining things that I think you see from the text that we read. It is not, it is not special revelation. It is not the written code that we have in the scriptures, for it says that it is written on the internal, inside the man. I think if we would look at this, we would find that it belongs to general revelation. But we can make this observations from our verse in chapter 3. It is helped by the law. Because in the law, their guilt that they feel inwardly is confirmed. And then it's also further, so it's confirmed by the law, and then it also shows them the place where forgiveness can be found, and that is in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which we would know as special revelation. The role of the conscience from our verses, again, the role is to condemn or defend the sinner of his or her response to the law of God. Romans 2.15, the Gentile conscience indicates, sorry, this is a definition, sorry, this is a definition of conscience from, um, it's called the big kiddo. In Romans 2.15, the Gentile conscience indicates responsibility. The conscience has here a judicial function, although it may defend as well as accuse. You see, that's the function of the tool. When it is lively, when it is strong, it functions well as something that watches and then warns one of incoming doom or pleasure. The definition continues like this. In general, the accusatory role of the conscience is weaker in Paul because the law acts as an incomparably sharper accuser. And even the law is set aside by the God who pardons and renews in Christ. A few more observations and then we are finished. This law or this conscience that God has gifted us with goes unused in the home, goes unused in our evangelism. Because we fail to have adequate knowledge of the law of God. Because we think that there's no relationship between the gospel and the law. But if you really would understand the gospel, you would understand that God's law and it have a very close relationship. That indeed, whether it be the child at home or the sinner on the streets, one cannot be prepared for said gospel until they know that they are guilty before a righteous and just God. You find out in the law that all that you do, all that you think, is an offense to this holy God. 
And then upon the backdrop of that darkness, the beauty of Christ's work shines. So my encouragement to you today who have this authority that is found in the gospel. Do not neglect the law to the prayer of your children. Do not neglect the law to the prayer of the lost. Preach it and just don't stop there. Bring the gospel to bear upon their hearts and souls. Father, I thank you for your word, for again, it is true. And Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to grow in our knowledge and our understanding, our understanding, Lord, of the authority of the church, of the authority of the family, of the authority of the state, and of the authority of the individual. And Lord, I pray that if there was one thing that was learned here, that these are all mechanisms that were given by you to glorify you and to restrain the wickedness of men. Father, let them be used as such. In Jesus' name, amen.